Hello everybody, my name is Kai Wehner and I work as technology evangelist for Tipco Software. Today I want to show you a comparison of different open source framework for integrating the Internet of Things. A very hot topic these days and there are plenty of different cool frameworks available and I want to explain you when to use which one and how they differ. For that let's start with the key takeaways of this session. IoT integration frameworks are used to develop lightweight IoT edge applications and microservices. They are part of a hybrid integration architecture. There is, there is no single framework which solves all the problems. You need usually more of them. And IoT integration frameworks are complementary to cloud platforms and streaming analytics solutions. We will see how these relate to each other at the end of the session. With that, let's take a look at the agenda for this session. First, I will talk a little bit about the IoT trends and challenges and why a hybrid integration architecture is the new default in the future in most enterprises. Then I will talk about IoT integration in general and the different kind of frameworks available, data pipelines, streaming processing, process engines. And then I will take a deeper look into some of the process engines as open source, Eclipse Cura with OPG Camel and Node-RED and Flowgo. And finally I will talk about the relation of these integration frameworks to cloud IoT platforms from Google, Amazon and so on. Let's begin with the trends and challenges of IoT. First, short definition, Internet of Things. That refers to the ever-growing network of physical objects that need connectivity and that need to communicate with each other. Without that, there is no Internet of Things. They have to communicate with each other. It's not just a few devices. It's the devices talking with each other and sending information to each other. If you take a look at many different analysts, the forecast for 2020, you will have at least 20 billion devices, maybe even more. And if you think about 2025 or 2030, the number will be even higher. So we have a lot of IoT in the future and we have to work with that somehow. Already in 2016, there is over 300 IoT platforms on the market with many different frameworks, technologies and sensors and all that stuff. And all of these have to work with each other, which is, I think, a huge challenge, but necessary so that you can leverage the benefits of Internet of Things. If you take a look at Gardner um, and its market guide for IoT integration, there's one interesting statement which says through 2018, so only in one and a half years from now, half the cost of implementing IoT solutions will be spent on integration. And that's simply the reason because, as I said in the beginning, these devices have to communicate with each other to get added value out of that. And therefore, without integration, there is no Internet of Things. That's really one of the key success factors for IoT projects. If you take a look at this from a higher perspective, um, there is the core integration and infrastructure, and as you see in the middle, which runs the business. This is your on-premise deployments or in the public cloud, where you run all your integration to mission-critical systems and to legacy systems, to cloud services and so on. But now we also see the edge, which changes the business, and in specific in this session now we talk about the Internet of Things. with cars, with smartphones, with any kind of device which communicates with other devices, which might be also in the edge or with devices or with interfaces to systems in the core, but we have to interconnect all of that. And this IoT stuff creates a lot of new challenges. For example, these devices are not connected to the cloud, they have low bandwidth or latency of connectivity is significantly lower and often the connectivity is not reliable. And even if all of that would work, it's still very expensive if you have to communicate with all of these IoT devices all the time. With 20 billion devices we have to do a lot of internet um, communication. So a lot of challenges and for that there are a lot of cool standards available on the market like MQTT, Co-op, OPC, URS or many 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 more. And these are available on different abstraction levels so some are just for messaging, some are more in the process layer and for doing standardized processes and so on. But really the key is there is not a single one standard. 
there are many different scenarios and use cases and technologies. So we have a lot of different standards on different levels available. And that's huge challenges which we have to solve. And for that we come to the next point in the agenda, the hybrid integration architecture. And um, before we talk about that in more detail, let's think again about how we do integration. Integration in the end has two parts. It has connectors to connect to different technologies, also IoT technologies, or to specific applications. Like we have seen in the beginning, the 300 different IoT applications already available on the market. And then we have the process design tools. We do things like process calls, data conversion, like transitions and decisions. And these connectors and process design tools together are used to build integration processes. These are really the integration flows which build integration between legacy systems, IoT devices and whatever you want to integrate with each other. So this is the same for 20 years now, but we have many different options for that depending on what scenario we want to solve. Also in common, all of these use the enterprise integration patterns. This is some functionality like filtering or content-based routing or aggregation. So these patterns are also used in any kind of integration project. No matter if you implement it by yourself with some Java or .NET code or whatever you want to use, or if you use some tooling which has already implemented that for you, these integration patterns are used always in these integration scenarios. But in addition, we do not have just one integration solution or framework which we can leverage in the meantime because we really need a pervasive integration with many different user roles. We have the integration specialists, but we also have some kind of citizen integrator, which have some technical capabilities, but they are not the experts in all the lower level technologies. And we even might have some ad hoc integrators, which only have business knowledge and want still to integrate some stuff. And then we have all the different technologies, we have application to application integration, B2B, we have cloud services, mobile apps and IoT, which is the focus of this talk. And around all of that we have different governance models, operations and the different deployment models. Therefore we have huge challenges and um, there is simply no one size fits all IoT integration or integration in general anymore. And for that, we are talking more and more about hybrid integration platforms. And the analysts are sure this is the new default in most enterprises to solve all your integration problems from on-premise, as you see here on the left with um, application integration, for example, using an enterprise service bus, or using modern cloud native integration solutions, application integration on a platform as a service like Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes like IPaaS solutions which are hosted by the integration vendors so you only use it but do not have to think about the infrastructure and operations or like ISAS which is used by the business users for doing integration in the public cloud and then we use API management to expose our APIs to other users and developers to leverage them and combine them and in addition to all that in the meantime we now also see edge integration <coughs> This is also really about integrating edge devices and especially important for Internet of Things. And so we have a hybrid integration architecture with many different components. And today I want to focus really on the right side on how to do the edge integration and how that is related also to the other ones. Therefore, after this motivation and, and short overview, let's talk about IoT integration and what that is, because there are many different options for different use cases. First, let's um, think about this in general, and where we hear another new new term, which is called fog computing. Or some vendors also call this edge computing. And the key difference really is that you do not always have the communication between cloud and the devices, but often you have device-to-device -device communication. So that's really changing the things because now you have much more computing and communication at the edge and the logic cannot be always in the cloud or in the on-premise data center. That's basically the key difference, um, what many call for computing. And the key thing here really is to keep the data closer to the edge for all the reasons we already discussed like latency issues, bad connectivity or simply the 
communication costs between the cloud and the edge all the time with the billions of devices. And with that, let's take a look at a typical IoT integration scenario. So here on the left side, we have these devices, and then we have a gateway so that all the devices communicate with the cloud or on-premise business applications. And these applications also send all the control events to the devices, and these send the feedback back here. So there's a lot of communication ongoing all the time, and this has some problems like the connectivity is unreliable or when non-trivial latencies in the hops between these communication steps and as I said already the network costs are adding up quickly with all these different IoT devices. So a better and more modern IoT integration blueprint would add integration logic also in the gateway here and also at the devices. So you do not build all your integration in the business microservices or applications, but also add logic in the gateways or in the devices. This has a lot of benefits, so you have local control, it is more reliable, and you also have less traffic to the cloud applications, and that's lower costs and TCO, and also you can leverage edge integration and even processing here to do more smart things without even talking to some cloud or remote service. So this is the, the application blueprint which make, makes much more sense in IoT scenarios. And for that let's take a look at different options how you can integrate with IoT. The first one is the data flow pipeline. If we talk about data flow, that's really more or less um, something like ETL. So you extract from sources, you transform it in different pipes with different operations, and then you send the data to the to the final destination and the load part. And this is called pipeline or data flow pipeline. This absolutely makes sense sometimes, especially if you want to simply use high throughput straight through um, data flows to really do simple or even more complex ETL to get data from A to B. You leverage patterns like transformation, routing, aggregation in that and um, this is available for both for batch and in the meantime much much more also for stream processing with all these IoT devices. So um, what's important about these data flow pipelines is that this should not be mixed up with stream, process stream processing for event correlation which I will talk about in a minute, but data flow pipelines are really just putting things from A to B with some transformation and so on and with high throughput. And for that, these are the perfect tools. Here are a lot of examples which are available on the market. There are things like um, Apache NiFi on the left, which also includes MyNiFi, a new project which you can deploy closer to the edge in the meantime. Here's stream sets and a cask hydrator. That's three open source projects which also all have um, a web UI for doing the integration and the coding to develop these ETL and data flows. And we have other classic vendors like Talent and Pentaho which use also open source technologies with a business model on top. And we have Informatica, the, the older and uh, longer available proprietary um, ETL vendor which also allows building these data flow pipelines. So a lot of um, available on the market and many of them, uh, in this case all of these besides Informatica use the open source or open core business model for that. So great tools for doing data flows, but um, data flows are not always the right thing. So if you want to do more than just data pipelines from A to B, then you can also use stream processing, or some call this event processing, or some call this streaming analytics. The key really here is you want to do more correlation while integrating all these devices. So here it's really about correlating event streams, and you really take a look at continuous queries and sliding windows. So that's a key difference to just taking uh, uh, data from A to B. You correlate it and aggregate it while the data is still in motion. This is used for scenarios like predictive analytics, predictive maintenance, fraud detection or cross-selling, where you want to really act on the data while it is happening. And for that, in the meantime, you can also leverage many more powerful technologies. For example, um, you often see now that you apply machine learning and analytic models to stream processing while the data is in motion. 
And here you can leverage many different technologies like R or Spark or um, H2O or commercial vendors like SaaS and MATLAB. So the key here really is that you can apply all that to continuous queries while the data is in motion. And that's a very different concept than the data flows and ETL, which I discussed before, but also very, land, uh, very relevant for real-time IoT integration scenarios. There are also very uh, many vendors and frameworks in the market, a lot of open source, for example, on the bottom left, Apache Flink, Spark Streaming, Apache Storm, Samsa. Then you also have, of course, some commercial vendors like Tipco, IBM, Softwarey, and also the cloud vendors like Amazon and Microsoft are offering some stream processing frameworks in the cloud already. So here is one example where you see this again, so um, streaming analytics for predictive maintenance, where you correlate different IoT sensors for voltage, temperature and vibration. And while the data is in motion, you always apply to every single event this rule if the vibration spike is followed by a temp spike, then a voltage spike and all of that in a sliding window with, in this case, four hours, then send a flag with high severity alert. So that's one example of stream processing for IoT scenarios. And this in the end was just the introduction to show you more about a process engine which I want to focus the rest on the talk on because this is really what I mean with IoT integration frameworks because the key difference here is that you really deploy these also at the edge. It's not just for processing data from A to B or for uh, continuously querying them and analyzing them but also for doing integration at the edge. And therefore, let's talk about a process engine. A process engine is to integrate and wire together different hardware devices, sensors, APIs, and online services. Again, you leverage all these integration features like transformation and filtering, enrichment, and so on. But in addition, you do many things which are not done by a typical ETL tool or by a streaming analytics tool, like retrying, rerouting, waiting, resuming, and these are the typical use cases which you can do at the edge, for example for device management or device activation, where you really want to do logic at the edge. So this is much more than just ETL, and typically this is done in real time. And it can therefore be synchronously or asynchronously communication. This is the basic characteristics of a process engine. And for the use cases at the edge in the Internet of Things world, you can think about consumer IoT like device registration or management, device diagnostics or usage billing. And the industrial IoT, you can think about device diagnostics, performance optimization or asset management, for example. There are many more use cases, but here you already see how it differs from classical data flows and stream processing use cases. And for that, I want to now focus on several different IoT process engines and show them and also their differences in more detail. There are especially three frameworks I want to talk about. I think all of these are really great frameworks. Apache Cura combined with Apache Camel and then Node-RED and then Flogo. These three IoT process engines have a lot in common. So all of them are open source frameworks available so that you can do with that whatever you want without any kind of license cost or subscription. You can connect to any kind of IoT device with all of them like MQTT, Coop or REST or many others. Um, they all have a web UI for visual coding and testing and debugging and you can really deploy them at the edge and, and that's also one of the key points why to use them. They are all for developers or integration specialists, partly also for citizen integrators, so if you're not a coder but have some technical knowledge, you can at least use Node-RED and Flogo very well for Cura. I think that's really for developers only. And all of them are extendable with SDKs, APIs, so all of these frameworks are, are thought to be used by the public for your own projects and you can customize them however you want to do that. Let's take a look at them in more detail. First, Eclipse Cura. And here it's important we, we use um, this here in combination with Apache Camel. That's very important and I will talk more about that. 
Eclipse Cura, um, which is a cool um, IoT gateway, but it really focuses on the gateway features, as we will see next. Um, it's also open source available, as you can see here on GitHub. And the key thing here is that it announced a few weeks ago that it's now out of the box integrated with Batchy Camel, an integration framework. And this combination of an IoT gateway plus an integration framework makes this a nice combination. A little bit more details, um, Eclipse Cura, um, it's an IoT gateway and it's based on Java and OSGI. Um, you have a web UI for configuration of the devices, network and protocol. It's under the Eclipse public license or an open source. It's a major framework, it's around three years old and um, it uses some kind of best of breed idea. So usually you use it together with other IoT Eclipse projects. So you use Eclipse Cura for the gateway, you use Eclipse projects for smart home and the MQTT server and client. And then you can also combine it with Apache Camel because um, Cura itself is not really an integration framework, it's just the gateway part. And so to compare it with the other two, with Node-RED and Flogo, you have to use it with Camel, I think, Tom, that, that makes sense. Also, Eclipse Cura and Camel, that's really more focused for developers and integration specialists. So um, it's not that easy to set up and getting started and simply implement a short integration flow via a web UI. So here really you usually use sort code and manage the libraries and dependencies and so by yourself. So that's basically um, the characteristics of Cura and Camel together. And here again to, to differentiate Cura from Camel. So Cura, and I have put this screenshot from a an, from an great introduction to Cura video on YouTube, as you can see in this link on the bottom. And this really focuses on gateway duties for IoT, like hardware and field abstraction for sensors and IO access, managing network and connectivity for all the different technologies, including Wi-Fi and VPN. And you manage things like start and stop remotely, um, install and uninstall application, and all of these um, kind of things. Therefore, the architecture of Cura looks very similar to these IoT gateway features. So you really manage connectivity, network, field protocols, and all these things which you want to do in an IoT framework or gateway. Here's an Hello World, which you can see um, from the Cura website. And here you already see um, that it is based on Java and OSGI and that you really have to do some kind of, of coding and configuration for getting started. So you need to know about OSGI and uh, bundles and activators and these kind of things to set up an example. And then you can use, as you see here on the right side, a nice web UI to manage the devices and all the other connectivity stuff and so on. In addition, we have to talk about Apache Camel. This is an open source integration framework which allows you to integrate all kind of technologies via a domain specific language, which you see here on the right side. And you can connect to many different technologies and endpoints with that. You can see here on the right side a short code example in Camel, they call it integration routes. And here you always have some kind of input, like in this case a file. Uh, folder and then you leverage some integration patterns like split and content-based routing to send this kind of information and data to um, output um, endpoints like a file system again or a JMS queue or a mock or whatever kind of technology you want to integrate here. That's basically the idea behind Apache Camel and now um, a few weeks ago, there was the Eclipse Cura component for Apache Camel announced. So now you can out of the box without any specific coding um, leverage both together. And that's um, what really makes sense so that now you can leverage the IoT Gateway Cura with the integration framework Camel to combine this for IoT integration based on the Java platform. The next one is Node-RED, which I want to show you in more detail. Node-RED is um, published by IBM, but it's also, again, completely open source. You can use it for free. It has no direct relation to IBM. 
and um, it's also a major framework, pretty cool to um, interconnect um, APIs and IoT devices and so on. Here you see the web UI, um, it's a great visual designer and that's also a difference to Eclipse Cura and Camel, so this one is really focused on developing in the web UI, where you implement the connectivity and the integration logic for your integration flows. Um, characteristics of Node-RED, um, its focus is on integration on an IoT gateway. Um, it's built on Node.js, which is heavily leveraging JavaScript, and it's very, very easy to install um, on your laptop to try it out and play around. It's good documentation to create a first integration flow. It has good examples. It's based on the Apache 2.0 license, and it's also a major framework around three years old. It has very good integration with IBM Bluemix Cloud Platform, um, but again, you can also use it anywhere else with any kind of other technology and infrastructure. And what's also nice, you can sh deploy it on any kind of um, platform and you can share, as you can see here, your flows as very simple JSON strings. And that's easy um, to integrate that into version control or into other automatic tools. For example, if you want to do some quality assurance on the integration flows, you just have to analyze the JSON strings. One um, disadvantage of um, Node-RED is that you do not really have binaries in the end to share, so you um, just develop your integration flows in Node-RED and then you deploy them there in the engine and run them there. That means that you also have to install the runtime on the um, gateway device or on the device you want to run it on. Though this will run on a Raspberry Pi, for example, pretty good, but um, you might have issues on smaller devices where the um, resource requirements are um, not as powerful and you simply cannot run this, this JavaScript framework there, then this is an disadvantage. Let's take a short look at Node-RED because, as I said, it's very easy to use and though I want to show it to you. So here we see Node-RED running on my local laptop. I can access it via the web UI. And installation is very easy. We can use RPM here on a Mac, or you can use a Windows installer and so on. And it's pretty easy. So let's go to the web UI. And here now I want to first start with a very simple Hello World example. I want to use the inject to send some dummy data. And I want to use a debugger to print it out. And that's basically it for my first Hello World flow. And then I can deploy this one very easily. And then we go to debug. And I can send messages here. And this simply sends a timestamp. Um, and the timestamp here is um, all the time I click. It sends a new event. And the debug component prints it. I want to do it a little bit more powerful. And by the way, I also just used the Hello World example from the good Node-RED documentation for that. And therefore, I also use a function component. And in this function component, let's add it here. And now I can double click and write some code. And as you see here, so you need some kind of technical um, knowledge to do some of the more powerful things in these kind of tools. So it's not really for the business user. And OK, we have now the function. Let's also give it a name, transform. And what we are doing here, we are transforming the date so that we have a nicer output. So we need to deploy this again, and now it should show the date in the right way. So this looks much better. This is a first integration flow um, built with Node-RED. It's pretty easy to learn and understand and getting started, as you can see here. Um, but what you also can see already here is that it's not really the tool for the very powerful and complex integrations. So if you have seen some tools um, which allow ESB-like integrations with complex mappings and uh, powerful routings and so on, then here you are a little bit more limited. And the same is true because it's a web IDE. You cannot do as powerful things as in a Eclipse or any other Visual Studio like um, IDE. But for this kind of IoT scenarios, it's pretty cool and, and usually always sufficient. Remember, this is edge use cases and not running the core infrastructure systems. 
And so what's also cool is um, we have the Node-RED library with some um, different examples which you can take a look at and use. Usually you cannot really use them and practice them, but you can take a look and play with them and, and learn how to build other components. And as I said, with uh, Node-RED and also later with Logo, um, these kind of um, implemented flows are just JSON files, which you can then export and import and also integrate into any kind of tooling. So here now I import an, um, a new flow. In this case, this is a real world, um, or not a real world, but um, at least an, a real IoT example with MQTT and so on. And I just import it here. And um, as you can see here now, we have a more complex flow here. So um, here you see um, that we integrate some sensors. In this case, it's we are an MQTT broker and we see the MQTT topic and which quality of service we use. And then we can do some other things like, um, for example, here we have a um, delay node where we can say send just one message per second. And this way you use all the different activities and um, then configure them. And also here you see we have again some um, JavaScript code for doing some more powerful coding also. And this is how a typical, um, more complex workflow runs. And then you always have simply to deploy it and then you can test it and analyze the log and um, to find errors and to redevelop it. And finally, then you can run it in production. Again, to do that, um, you have to run um, the Node-RED instance on the device. So you have to deploy it here and then import the flows to run them there. Um, that's fine if you can live with deploying um, Node-RED, um, so JavaScript on that device, like a um, Raspberry Pi. Um, if you want a more um, memory, less memory consuming stuff, then Node-RED might be the wrong uh, tool for that. But here it's pretty cool and um, it's also very mature, so you can use all of that pretty good, it works well. But also, um, what I found out because of the library, if you import some things with custom stuff, um, that might always create problems. So for example, um, after I imported this one, which has some new activities, which I do not have here, um, it might be true that this um, flow does not work anymore. So you, here you see um, it contains some unknown nodes, and I still can deploy it, um, but now um, I see an error here, node not deployed, and so um, be careful with um, importing something from the library because afterwards what I did, um, I have to remove all the um, stored data here and then when I run it again it's all empty and then I can start from the beginning again. So be careful with what you um, download from the public library a little bit. But it's still cool to learn about new activities and see some other examples. This was the example with Node-RED, pretty cool for IoT integration um, with the Visual Coding Editor. And let's now also take a look at Flogo. Flogo was open sourced in October 2016, so it's a very, very young integration framework for IoT. Um, it's right now available in the um, developer release, so it's really a preview in the end um, and will get much more major in the next month, of course. And you also see here, it's also available on GitHub. You can go to the code or the documentation and examples, community, and so on, like with every open source project. Here you see one example of the web UI. It's very similar to Node-RED from the coding perspective. You can use the web UI um, to configure all the stuff and run it here. So it's also pretty nice and intuitive um, and as easy to install and getting started as Node-RED. A uh, little bit about the facts here. The focus of Flogo is again also on integration on an IoT gateway like Node-RED, um, but it's also intended to be used for very lightweight edge application. This can either be on an IoT gateway also, but even on much more um, limited resources like sensors or um, less powerful computers. So not always a uh, Raspberry Pi can be used, but we need less powerful things. And then you might struggle with JavaScript or Java applications and might be happy if you can use things like Flogo, which is powered by Go. Go programming language which is very lightweight and um, therefore this is probably also the key differentiator to things like Node-RED and Cura if you need lightweight integration and microservices. It's also open source under the very permissive BSD 
license um, so you can use it and do what that with whatever you want and as I said before it's right now in developer preview released in October 2016 and um, this one can also be run on a variety of platforms you can also share um, the different flows and JSON strings um, the same story like with Node-RED but what's pretty cool here is that you can also export it as a your application or microservice as a lightweight binary with zero dependencies and therefore you can install that binary one single file on a device and this can be an edge device, a sensor or whatever then um, works with that and that's a key difference to Node-RED which you have to run um, where you always have to run the complete Node-RED JavaScript um, or Node.js engine. So one cool feature I want to mention here is the web native step back debugger. Um, that's pretty cool because you can really in the web IDE um, do debugging without restarting the complete application again and again. You can interactively design and debug and simulate sensor events, even change data and configuration. And you can even leverage that for remote ops debugging. So let's think about you have deployed an integration flow on a sensor or small device and you want to analyze it there um, because IoT debugging often is very complex and this helps you there a lot um, if you want to connect to that. Let's also take a short look at Flobo in action. So here we are now uh, at the Flogo um, development environment. I just want to show you here um, two different um, services. One is the weather service. Um, let's first run it before I talk more about the details. You can see here now um, that when I click run that um, in the end um, compiles the code and runs the example here. And so you see here in blue that this one runs successfully. Otherwise it would go to the error handler where you can also implement logic. But what you basically do, you have triggers, it's very similar to Node-RED, so um, here you receive an event, HTTP or MQTT or whatever, and then you use the different activities for locking um, or for filtering, for invoking other REST services like we do here with the weather service. You also see the um, response here, in this case I requested a weather from my hometown in Germany for Erlangen, and it's right now 6 degrees Celsius, and then we can also reply this to the trigger. So. This is a very example, simple example for an integration flow, um, but it shows you the basic concepts and here now you can could add um, different actions and activities. And I also have exported this one and that's um, one of these key um, issues or differentiators also. You can export this as binary for different devices and then you can also run this um, on the on the local laptop or on, on any edge device. And that's one of the um, key things which I want to show you shortly here. So um, let's go to my um, folder where I have built them. So here I'm in Flogo builds where I've exported a few different um, Flogo applications. And as you see here, that's really, um, this is very lightweight binaries which you can execute. So here, for example, I can execute the weather service. This is exactly the flow which I built in the web IDE. You see it started in a few milliseconds in this case. And I can access it from the web page, for example, as it is a REST service. Um, in this case, it just returns the flow ID, but I can also double check here in the terminal that this works as expected. And here it also returns my weather for my hometown Erlangen in this example. I just showed you how to export and start a Flogo example. And what you also can do, um, let's take a look at a little bit more ex uh, complex example. Um, in this example, I leverage um, a REST Swagger interface. Swagger, which is the de facto standard for REST interfaces for interface building, documentation, and testing it. And here we use the pet store from Swagger, which everybody can use. And um, we try to use a get service to get the pet with the ID 222. In this case now, the pet is existing. And what our integration flow here does, um, it does query if the pad is existing and based on the condition, if it is existing or not, it does some different integration logic or application logic. In this case, either you use the post um, REST service here of the pad store to create the pad if it is not existing, or if it is existing, you use the delete method with this REST service to delete the pad. So if we run the service once, 
we will now see the flow that as the pad is already existing, it flows here and deletes the pad. We can double check that in Swagger here also. And now we see the um, pad is not existing. And here now, um, to highlight this, one, this um, step back debugger feature, um, if I want to run it again, I can also start here from the middle in an activity. Let's run it from the query I pad. Here I say run from tile and now it starts just from here and executes the flow and in this case the condition is that the pad is um, not existing so it creates the pad again. Let's double check this too. Here you see now the pad was created again. And this is really one of the key benefits how now you can debug and test and also change configuration here in this step back debugger and only test parts of the flows. And if you think about more complex IoT scenarios or even, as I said, remote debugging on some edge devices, then this is a huge benefit instead of deploying the complete app all the time and doing some debugging and testing with that. Though that's pretty cool, I think. That was a short overview about Flowgo. Let's now go um, back to the presentation and let's highlight a little bit more about um, why Flogo um, has um, Golang uh, as language and why these lightweight microservices. So even if you want to not use a framework but code it by yourself, why it's important for edge apps and that it's not that heavyweight. And therefore um, Java, um, this was never an option for, for Flogo and probably the same for Node-RED, so it's too heavyweight. And also with Oracle, with the licenses, it's always a little bit of licensing risk for new products. And therefore, we thought about using Node.js for Flogo. This is more lightweight, and this is also used by Node.RED. Um, but as we wanted to really create a differentiating project with Flogo, um, we thought it's still not lightweight enough. We want to deploy it really at the edge and not just at a Raspberry Pi or so. And therefore, uh, probably the lightest one is C, C++, that's pretty cool for that and often used for, for devices and so on. But it's not really agile and not really a modern language and therefore um, what we chose was the Go language and that one is um, for more modern programming language um, used in things like Docker and Kubernetes. Um, it has a pretty cool concurrency um, model um, built into the language with Go routines, channels, no explicit Shrek programming like in Java. Um, it has modern memory management and what I also like, it's statically typed, that's pretty cool. And it's partly object oriented, so it has not all the power and complexity of Java like inheritance, but still it has a flexible type system and leverages things like composition. And pretty important, especially for IoT use cases, is this zero dependency programming model that you do not have to think about all the external libraries like you have to do with Java and OSGI. We all, all know about these library issues we have all the time. And finally, the key um, differentiator for using Golang was the speed, the ultra-fast compilation and startup time, and the very lightweight footprint which we wanted to use. Because this now you see also um, the infrastructure layers. Um, here we see the different frameworks we discussed in the, in the past minutes. Eclipse Cura, Node-RED and Flogo. And here you see that Flogo, and contrary to the other two, does not have this um, heavyweight framework in the middle with either um, Java and OSGI or JavaScript and Node.js. Um, so that's simply one of the reasons why it's much more lightweight. And also all is included in the zero dependency model. So as I showed you, you have just one binary which you can deploy at the edge. You do not have to have the complete runtime like with Node-RED deployed at the edge where you want to execute it. And therefore, if you compare the resource requirements, you simply see that um, both on disk and at runtime, but also for startup time and memory consumption, it's simply a um, completely different story. And that's really... Um, dependent what do you want to do and what's your use case. Often this is fine to have a little bit of memory requirements and usage. Then um, for example Node-RED might be a pretty cool integration framework because um, one of the advantages is that it's very mature and uh, Flogo in contrary is uh, right now as we have seen developer previews are very new. So you simply have to think about what makes sense for you. If you still want to go with Java and it's fine for you um, with the IoT Gateway and Apache Camel in addition with Cura, it's still pretty cool for some kind of use cases. Though there is no, this is the best or so, it depends on the use cases.
One more outlook about Flogo. Um, Flogo, we also want to really deploy Flogo Nano services on microcontrollers. So this is the next step that we deploy parts of the Flogo runtime even on a nano controller. As you see here, this is really very, very small devices. And even these will get um, some kind of integration logic for some simple things like filtering or aggregation, so that you can do some things even there at the end of the edge, right? And not just in the gateway. So um, this was an overview about a lot of different integration options, including all these process engines. Let's now in the end also talk about um, how this is related to cloud IoT platforms. Therefore, I simply want to show you a few of the different reference architectures. Here you see the Intel reference architecture, where you have things, the devices on the left, the network with the IoT gateway in the middle, and the cloud on the right side. And in the end, these integration frameworks can be used especially in the network gateway uh, location. And sometimes if it's lightweight enough, you might even use it directly in the devices. So this is, for example, where maybe Flogo might be easier to deploy than a Node-RED or Eclipse Core or, um, with Camel or so. The same is true for the Amazon IoT reference architecture. Amazon has a lot of cool services, but of course all of them are running in their public cloud including authentication and authorization, a device gateway, rules engine, and so on. But you also have to um, deploy integration logic at the edge, as we discussed in the last hour. And therefore, it makes also sense to use um, these kind of things like Cura, Node-RED, or um, Flogo at the edge. Google IoT reference architecture is um, very similar, a lot of Google services. And here again, you have the gateway um, at the edge, and here again, you can use Node-RED, Cura, or Flogo there too. One final um, slide um, about IBM's OpenWhisk. This is an open source project, so you can use it with IBM Cloud, um, but you can also use it on your own infrastructure or another cloud. And it's a serverless computing framework. It's event-based. And here the benefit is for these kind of serverless architectures that you really just pay only for what you use. You do not care about the um, Linux or Windows instances you have to manage or the, the Docker containers you have to manage on instances. You really just call, uh, think about the request which you make. Um, and this is even based and you pay per request for the memory and CPU you use. And for that, um, you can think about where does it make sense to use even these IoT integration frameworks. And you can deploy them here directly in the serverless computing infrastructure. Um, here again, that's perfect for Flogo, of course, because it's so lightweight. Um, the Hello World uses 3 meg of memory, and therefore it's very lightweight and therefore very cost-effective for these serverless architectures. Um, you can also deploy it in the edge here and combine it with serverless computing. That's then true, of course, for all of them, Flogo, Node-RED, and Cura. And for the edge app on the device, again, um, you could deploy things like Flogo, for example. So to summarize this up, um, a hybrid integration is the new default and there is no one size fits all. We've seen a lot of technologies today and open source frameworks for data flow pipelines, um, for stream processing and for IoT process engines. All of them make sense and uh, think about a scenario and which one is best for you. So let's finish with the key takeaways. IoT integration frameworks are used to develop lightweight IoT edge applications and microservices. They are part of a hybrid integration architecture, so they are just one part of the complete solution at most enterprises. And they are very complementary to IoT cloud platforms and streaming analytics. And often it makes sense to combine different IoT integration frameworks. As we have seen for data flows, it's sometimes absolutely valid to do ETL and use one of these frameworks. And on the other side, if you need a process engine, then something like um, Cura with Camel or Node-RED or Flogo might be the best choice. And with that, let's finish this up. Um, I, I hope I gave you a good overview and if you have any questions, just come back to me or post under this video. And thanks for watching it.